we look at trying to create opportunities for everybody that comes here based on their passion. And if you can do that, then they can start to work towards, you know, making money in that livelihood, doing what they love, and that increases a chance for success. And I say it it could apply to anybody if you think about it. But I think for people with ADHD or dyslexia or whatever it is, having that bright light every day that's exciting and interesting and engaging for them is even more critical. ADHD Rewired, episode 95. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank our sponsors. Support for this podcast comes from Audible. For a free audiobook download, go to ericktivers.com slash audible for a link for that free download and for some hand-picked recommendations. Go to ericktivers.com slash audible for your free audiobook download. Hey there, ADHD Rewired community members and listeners. I hope you are all having a great week. If you are getting ready to celebrate Christmas, I hope you are having a very Merry Christmas. And to everyone else, I wish you all a very happy holidays. I've had a couple of busy days here at the ADHD Rewired Workshop. I had over 100 people register for the ADHD Rewired webinar, High-Tech and Low-Tech Solutions to Supercharge Your Productivity. If you missed it or couldn't make it, fear not, my little elves. Santa will do it again. And I really shouldn't use this, but I'm going to just keep going. We'll do it again on Wednesday, December 30th at 1.30 p.m. Central Time. Check the show notes for a link. Early registration for the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group will be ending soon. Before the price goes up or this group fills up, schedule a free 20-minute consultation with me. Go to coachingrewired.com. With the ability to pay over six months, there has never been a better time to invest in you. Go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. And prepare to get your ADHD rewired. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am thrilled to have two guests today joining me in the virtual ADHD Rewired studios. You know, a lot of what we do on ADHD Rewired is focusing on strategies to kind of help us be more productive. And we know that a lot of people with ADHD, especially adults with ADHD, also have a tendency towards entrepreneurship. My guests today are Tom Bergeron. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. <laughs> Tom Bergeron and Rick Fiery. They are the co-founders of Inventive Labs, a business incubator focused on adults with ADHD or dyslexia and and related challenges. Uh, The lab runs a hands-on program fostering creativity and teaching the business skills needed to develop your own product or start your own business. So Rick and Tom, welcome to ADHD Rewired. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Great to be here. And uh, just so everybody knows what we went through uh, before we actually hit record. So they are in a, what would you say, an industrial office space? Yeah, it's a mill building that's been restored, uh, that's been built out. And a lot of these buildings, which visually are very nice, acoustically are are pretty awful. Um, So... Right now, I, I, I had Rick and Tom surround themselves basically in couch cushion pillows um, to <laughs> decrease the echo uh, for you guys. And you know, I, I just like giving a little bit of the, the background of what we kind of do to, to kind of get this going. So and it's very, us, very cozy. <laughs> they're going to be sweating here soon. <laughs> so tell us kind of your backstory. Um, uh, whose kind of idea was this? So kind of give us a... a 
a um a look into kind of who each of you are um who wants to go first <laughs> well i guess i'll take a stab at it so uh i myself am uh, i guess you could say a serial entrepreneur this, I this out, is rick talking yeah this is rick and i started out as a civil engineer uh and uh realized pretty quickly that uh, designing roads, you might detect a little bit of a pattern here, that designing roads was a little bit boring. And I switched over to the computer-aided design side of the industry, and that was new and exciting back in the, I hate to say it, but the late 80s, or early 90s, and got to work in the computer-aided design world for a while and got frustrated by a particular product that I was working with and decided I wanted to find a way to take it to market. So I went back and got an MBA at that point uh, because as an engineer, I didn't know the difference between a debit or a credit. Uh, it was a complete mystery. Uh, and at the MBA program that I went through, it, I went to Wharton and uh, I majored in entrepreneurship and finance and I was able to create a business while I was there and raise money for it and eventually won the uh, business plan competition at the school uh, to launch my first company. And after leaving Wharton, um, I went and started uh, building a business. We grew it from four people uh, initially founding the company to where we were selling products in about 60 countries around the world when we were done. And got acquired by a larger company and started to run finance. And I think uh, many people understand that this was an interesting story for me. Uh, it was at a bigger company. I wasn't really a finance guy. And after about two years, I figured it out. Um, it, we had subsidiaries in 40 countries around the world. Uh, and I was driving the audit pr uh, program there. And after, after I figured it out, it got boring. Every month, I woke up dreading going in and doing the same thing every day. So I had to go to another startup. And uh, I, I did that. I left much to my wife's chagrin. Uh, packed up the family, moved from Pennsylvania back to Massachusetts at age 45. People thought I was crazy. Did yet another startup, grew it. And uh, long story short, exited out of that and started looking for the next big idea. And Tom So you like to solve puzzles, and then once you solve the puzzle, you never want to look at it again. Yeah, you could probably say that. <laughs> That's why I say you might detect a pattern here. So to me, the challenge was creating the businesses, creating the ideas. And very quickly, uh, as we were trying to figure out kind of the next big thing, uh, we, we, uh, Tom and I reconnected. I should probably let Tom fill in with his story because we intersected. Okay. And right up to the point of creating Inventive Labs, we had a few intersection points. And then we can tell you the story of how it was built. All right. So that was Rick's story. Tom, tell us your story. Yeah, Eric. So for my story, actually, it's interesting because it's in some ways it's similar. Uh, I started working in the computer aided design industry as well. I was actually an engineer and uh, started programming. Found that as an environment there, you know, there wasn't enough uh, excitement and interaction going on. So I actually switched over to the side of working with customers, trying to figure out what their problems were. And it was a great opportunity for me because I get to work with people from so many different industries, from architecture to mechanical engineers, et cetera, helping solve their problems that they would work on, you know, pen and paper. And we would take that to the computer aided design side and make it work. Um, I was fortunate to have worked for a company that grew quite a bit. We acquired a lot of the other folks in computer aided design industry. Eventually we were able to go public and then acquired by Autodesk, who was the biggest player in that industry. Now um, Autodesk, they, they, um, they make there's a there's an app that I that I like that I think that they're a part of a Pixlr it's like a graphic app. Yeah, that... they do. They started off in computer aided design, but okay. they do an awful lot in the um, animation industry, um, special effects in films, etc. So it's like actually a great company. I like to work in there, but working for a big company just drove me crazy. Okay, what what drove me crazy <laughs> about it? Just like the kind of the the operational side of it, not feeling like you're you're you know that you're just a uh, kind of a cog in the machine? Like what, what was it? It was probably the cog in the machine. It was like, do I do today? Does it really make a difference overall bottom line? And I really like to be in a smaller company where what you do, you can see the impact. Okay. The why question, why am I doing this? You get answered right away. All right. And then how did, how did your paths cross? Um, so actually at that time, I 
decided to leave Autodesk. I went to a dot com company, which was exciting because it took off and kind of crashed right away. And after it crashed at the dot com is when I connected up with Rick, uh, Rick's company, Infrasoft at the time. He was uh, looking to introduce a new product into the US market. That's really what my background was. How do you bring products into a market, especially disruptive products? And uh, so I can't. When you say disruptive products, tell tell the listeners kind of what, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So disruptive is a term that's typically used in the startup community. Mm -hmm. Something that really takes the way that people typically do does something and you disrupt it. Let's do it a different way. And I think we know most people don't like change. Some of us love it. Most people don't like change. And when you disrupt what they're doing with a better way, they resist it. And then they want, you know, eventually gets adapted or adopted and you move forward. Well, and I love this idea too, because I think when as, as listeners, you know, hearing about something being disruptive, you know, that could be something that really described how, at least how, how they were described uh, maybe through their childhood and, and maybe uh, even, even beyond that. So you're saying that there is this whole concept in the startup world where mm. a, a disruptive uh, model, a, a disruptive idea is what sort of people are going for. That's the, the disruptive things are the, are the next big ideas. Exactly. That's you know, the investment community. They love disruptive technology because they get the chance to really grow and change. Yeah, that's a really interesting way of putting it. Now that you frame it that way, I look back and that's what I like doing was disrupting things. And I bet a lot of viewers feel the same way about that. And that could explain why a lot of people really gravitate to entrepreneurship mm -hmm. as well. It's part of the fun is mm -hmm. being a disruptor. So, I'm not getting in trouble for it and actually having to be embraced. <laughs> well, absolutely. You know, I, I forgot who, who said this, you know, but, but, you know, as a kid, you know, you, you, uh, don't accept no for an answer and you're diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. As an adult, you need a, you know, a, a loan from a bank and 20 banks say no. And you finally get it in that 21st bank. That's called being persistent. And, you know, that's where it becomes in, an advantage. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a lot easier being an adult with, uh, with ADHD than it is being a kid. Um, so then how does ADHD um, and, and learning disabilities, uh, dyslexia, how does this all kind of fit into what you were? Are doing because you're not just a, you're not just a a startup kind of incubator you're a startup incubator focused on ADHD learning disabilities and, and different brain-based differences right and I think the, the story is where it intersects where Tom and I intersected was um, after getting together on the last the latest startup that we did uh, I was away from that company kind of brainstorming in an airplane hangar of all places speaking of echoey places there's another one <laughs> I think we like those uh, in an airplane hangar and trying to come up with new disruptive ideas that were interesting to pursue. You know, it just occurred to me, maybe we like echoey places because it just re then it reminds us what we just said. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, 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 a mental tape delay. Um, but what I was struggling a little bit with different ideas and then Tom uh, left and finally we were just doing it together. And really the, the evolution of the story was that, we were trying to, we knew we liked startups. We knew, we knew we liked the excitement of doing startups. And Tom was really leaning towards doing some kind of business incubator where, and if people don't know, an incubator is where people kind of come together, share ideas, create businesses, and then hopefully eventually get funding for their ideas so they can make them real and make them happen. Um, but in that same day, when we were having these conversations, we started talking about family members. Hey, can and I pause you really quickly? So this is a new, if this is a new concept to any of the listeners, and they just want to learn more about this as a concept, uh, any suggestions on where they can look? About incubators? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you Google, here's why we didn't do the standard incubator. If you just Google business incubators, you'll see a boatload of them. Okay. Um, so they aren't really, in our mind, they aren't really disruptive. <laughs> so keying on that theme, if you Google business incubators, you can find different things here in Massachusetts. There's uh, yeah, groups Mass, like mass challenge is a big one. Tech stars. Yeah. Tech stars. People might've heard of there are places where you can go, but what was different about us, we realized that there were a lot of those and that's part of the research that you do when you're doing startup research is Google it. And if you see a lot of people that can be a good sign or a bad sign, but for us, we, we thought it was a cool idea. We just let it sit for a bit. And as we talked further, we started talking about family members that we have. 
um, that have learning differences and things like ADHD or dyslexia. Um, in my case, um, my mother is absolutely brilliantly ADD. Uh, she is a ballet teacher uh, for 50 years. She's probably created um, more professional dancers than anybody else in the country. Oh, how neat. But, but nobody knows who she is because all she wants to do is teach ballet. She doesn't care about the business side or the other components, the PR. Her, her satisfaction is teaching people and making them very good. She doesn't really realize how good she was as a, at it. So we, we saw that. Um, Tom had family members as well uh, that were, were you know, facing some of these challenges, and we realized the discriminations that they faced in the real world. Tom, can, you, can you share play. some of, of your, those challenges from your, your perspective, your family's perspective? Because, you know, as, as I said, too, we, we really want to get an idea of, of who you guys are. Yep. I, I think uh, in my family, actually a lot of challenges academically. I, you know, myself as a young child, um, a lot of difficulties reading, you know, overly active, kind of different components of that. So school wasn't a great environment for me. Um, eventually kind of figured some things out, was able to get my degree in college, but again, that was still challenging kind of going through the whole process. And also how long, did, it that how long did that take you? And were there any, um, any, uh, kind of course corrections that you needed to take, uh, you know, big challenges, failures? Actually, um, I def definitely early on my first year I was trying a lot of do a lot myself. Uh, grades were super low. I was lucky to be able to get connected into a group of other folks, um, really build a community that could help with the subjects and the grades. And as I went on to the engineer and actually got better, and as the more technical courses came in, as opposed to some of the electives, I uh, tended to do rather well in that case. So, so, what, so what were some of the biggest things that you, you struggled with? Um, well, reading comprehension is kind of a challenge. Kind of keeping up with that is definitely a component. Um, the whole organization aspect of pulling different components together. There, you know, there were no such thing as accommodations or stuff like that. It was just, you know, bucket up. And, and Rick, uh, you, you, was, you shared with me uh, that, that you have um, uh, both ADHD and dyslexia. Is that correct? I actually um, haven't been formally diagnosed with either, either one of them. Um, definitely my son, verbal dyspraxia, which is very similar to um, dyslexia. And, you know, going through my son, helping him in school, the components, you know, we struggled with the same exact things. It was, if, I, if I had a dime for every time I heard that story, I have a lot of dimes. I, I, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's so common. Rick, well, um, what about you? Yeah, I've never been formally diagnosed, but if you look at my career path and the, the need to have new and exciting things to work on and the drive to, to take the risks that are associated with that. Another thing I like to do is I like to fly small airplanes. Um, so where you have everything on the line and if you aren't focused and you aren't diligent, then you could put yourself in a world of hurt. <laughs> uh, if you look at all the things that I like to do, and then you go and look up ADHD, it's kind of a roadmap to what I've done. Um, so in, in fact, I think one of the scenarios, one of the stories that somebody told me uh, when I was younger, uh, doing the first startup, he, he kind of held out his hands and he said, Rick, you know, with his left hand, he held it way out to the left side. Most people's risk tolerances are over here. And he took his hand and put it in the middle and said, risk takers that I know of are right here in the middle. And you're way out to the right. <laughs> you're way out to the right in, in loving and craving those kinds of things. But I think I looked at him and I, I, my reaction to that was, I don't see myself as a risk taker. And of course, he fell on the floor. And I said, yeah, but I'm doing what I think are calculated risks. If I'm confident that I can achieve it, then I'll do it. If not, you know, I, I won't go do it. So other people perceive it as risky. I don't really see it that way. Any, I see any it, of these big risks uh, not go as, uh, as you were hoping for? Did you ever miscalculate? I keep, my wife will tell me yes. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's get her on the line, can we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, luckily, luckily she's not here. Uh, but if you look at the kinds of risks that I've taken, um, it's, yeah, some things always don't go the way you plan, but then you've got to be able to pivot. Yeah. And if you're willing to pivot and adjust and not let impending doom scare you off, then you can find other ways. So 
for me, yeah, I think a lot of the things didn't go the way I thought, but I was always able to pivot and then keep charging forward. And as we tell people here in the program, when you hit those walls, when you hit those barriers that you think you can't get through, it's time to go into grind it out mode and keep your feet moving, keep leaning forward and keep your feet moving. And you might break through that wall and then you get to see what's on the other side. Um, so for me, yeah, there's lots of twists and turns that I've taken that I never predicted, but I've always kept my feet moving forward. What I want to do is um, we're going to uh, we're going to take actually a, a quick break here. Um, when we come back, you know, as as an entrepreneur myself, I, I have a lot of questions uh, that I'd love to to ask you because um, I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs who who do listen uh, to this podcast. So when we return, we're going to kind of get into the nitty gritty, and we'll be right back. Boom. Boom, 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 audible trial.com slash ADHD rewired for your free download trial.com slash ADHD rewired trial.com slash ADHD rewired go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD rewired for your free audiobook download Early registration for the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group will be ending soon. Before the price goes up or this group fills up, schedule a free 20-minute consultation with me. Go to coachingrewired.com. With the ability to pay over six months, there has never been a better time to invest in you. Go to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com and prepare to get your ADHD rewired. All right, we are back. And so we're going to dive right into kind of the nitty gritty of, of um, entrepreneurship. How do you help uh, people who come to Inventive Labs, um, but even more kind of broadly, um, what are, you know, when you look at what is the difference between, in your eyes, an entrepreneur and someone who is like a, a small business owner? Yeah, I think the big distance is big over to what Rick was talking about is think entrepreneurs tend to go at riskier ventures. Uh, we talked about disruptive things like that. I think small business owners quite often have a you know, maybe are passionate about something and they'll kind of move in and, and work with that. And it's usually, it's not that it's easy, but in some ways it's kind of a safer route to kind of move forward. Uh, I, I think family owned businesses are great. And I think a lot of people have them and it's a wonderful way to live. And we actually encourage that here at the lab. There's folks there that, that matches up for them. Um, versus the entrepreneur, you typically think of someone on a startup that's trying to do something different, trying to convince people that a different way of doing things is good. And, uh, that's kind of what we see on the entrepreneurial side. Rick, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, for us, when you look at it, our definition of success here, at least, is we don't have to create the next Google. So if you're an entrepreneur, you might be dreaming of being the next tech billionaire. Uh, a lot of people have those dreams. But for us, like Tom said, uh, you know, being successful for us is getting to do what you love, um, waking up every day excited about doing that and making enough money to forge a living. And that's a great way to live. So for me, as I guess an entrepreneur, I like the thrill of creating things. Um, whereas for me, running a corner store probably isn't my nature. But for other people that like to make stuff with their hands and build things and sell things. And, you know, we have a guy here that was interested in making smoothies um, and opening a smoothie store because he's passionate about that. You know, they're for other people, there's different things that excite them. And uh, as my dad always said, if everyone in the world wanted to do the same thing, nobody would ever be able to do what they want to do. Hmm. And diversity and different levels of entrepreneurship or wanting to start a business, I think, is kind of where we approach it from. We, we look at trying to create opportunities for everybody that comes here based on their passion. And if you can do that, then they can start to work towards, you know, making money in that livelihood, doing what they love, and that increases a chance for success. And I'd say, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily, shouldn't necessarily apply to people with learning differences. It, it could apply to anybody, if you think about it. 
But I think for people with ADHD or dyslexia or whatever it is, having that bright light every day that's exciting and interesting and engaging for them is even more critical. Um, so that's kind of the twist that we try to take with it. And that's our definition. You know, and, and one of the things that I look at too, is even from it, myself, uh, you know, looking at things like one of the, one of the first people that I, that I hired in my practice was a, a hired a billing service to do my billing. Mm. Uh, because, you know, I look at certain types of, of tasks if you can, um, if you can kind of delegate and outsource them for, I think most people, it's a nice luxury. I think for people with ADHD, like, you know, not to sound extreme, but I think almost life depends on it. You know, it's, right. it's, you know, so it's like, if, if you're, if you're going to take these risks, you know, both the, the risk and financial investment might be a little bit greater. Um, you know, but so over the last really year or so, um, I've been, Sort of dabbling in and really learning how to, uh, I guess, work with others on projects, to build a team, um, and it's hard. It's I, you know, I, I, I keep I, you know, you described, you know, I keep hitting these brick walls, and it's like, okay, like that didn't work. Let me try something else. That didn't work either. Okay, so uh, what I've been doing is kind of pulling back a bit and trying to learn, similar to how I learned, you know other productivity based strategies this stuff did not come naturally to me and i had to kind of really investigate and learn how do other people kind of do this and kind of go from there and kind of make it my own you know so just very recently i i listened to a four hour work week by tim ferris i listened to um virtual freedom by chris ducker and right now i'm listening to uh emeth and you know one of the things in because I'm really trying to learn the art of, of delegation and the difference between being a really a, an entrepreneur as as he talks about in Emeth um, is you know entrepreneurs sometimes what they do is they don't own a business they own a job and when I heard that I was like yeah, yeah that's because um, what you know I was thinking about this in the terms of for myself as you know the you know ADHD rewired and my and my practice itself my clinical practice is it's me right so if i got hit by a bus this afternoon um you know there's no more ADHD rewired and there's no more there's no more practice and that would that really saddens me to think that you know because what i try to do is help people not just strategically in their productivity but doing so in the realm of sharing stories, because um, I think that this story element is so important. And so one of the things that I have been kind of realizing, and this is a development in, in progress, is that for me as an entrepreneur, I have to really document everything that I am doing in order to really build a business that can operate without me, even though I have every intention of being, uh, being every part of it, um, because I love this work. I mean, it's, I, I come to work and I get to play most of the time. Um, so how do you kind of handle or teach um, those kind of components to it? So you're not just building a, uh, you're not just creating a job to own, but actually building a business. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that, you know, you're talking about delegation. One of the things that we found is quite often folks who've had ADHD or dyslexia have challenges. They're yeah. often used to reaching out to the people to help and kind of work. So you can see that as a negative, but it also comes across as a positive in many cases uh, because it allows you as someone who delegates to truly turn it, turn it over. You know, we have folks here who don't want anything to do with the financial side. Someone take it, run with me. I want to keep creating what I'm creating. If you convert, change that to someone else who's had a lot of success in life, been very good, they often tend to micromanage. You know, they want to know what's going on. They mm. used to be good at everything. They used to jumping in. And most people don't want to be micromanaged. They want the flexibility. They want to know what the goals are. So what we definitely find why a lot of entrepreneurs tend to be successful is they have folks that are willing to get, delegate and let other folks work on things. What they want to do is work on what they're passionate about. Maybe they micromanage that, but they're involved in that process and really diving in and kind of working with it. And that's that's a lot we try and do here is kind of work with folks of what do you do well at? What do you want to jump in? Where do you need things to delegate? Who can help you out with that? And, uh, you know, how do you work together? So tell, let, me, let me ask you this. You, you just mentioned, and I can very much relate to, you know, not wanting to deal with the financial side of things. Um, and you know, I've been there too. It's like, I, I remember when I, the first time I hired a billing service, I was just so relieved to have that off my plate. And then I just kind of uh, said, okay, there you go. Thank you. And that didn't work out <laughs> probably not surprisingly. Cause I was, it was the, 
okay, finally someone to do it without any training, without any, you know, it's just like, you, you know what I'm thinking, right? Yeah. <laughs> so how do you kind help of, people kind of recognize and what are the like, kind of strategic pieces of, you know, as an entrepreneur, yes, I, my strength is not in the, the details of the financial piece of it, but as the, the business owner, I do have to know about it. How do you help people with that? That's a great way of putting it. So we work a lot with folks on called a profit and loss statement. Basically it's, you know, where are you making money and where are you spending money and making sure you're making a profit from that. And really the way we look at it is every number on that sheet should really be a story. You know, it's not just, this is the cost of my rent. It's, this is the cost of my rent because this is the location I'm going to be at. You know, I'm a storefront, so I need to have a good location, et cetera. So there's a story behind those numbers as you go through. Uh, we've been working with uh, Becca here, who's a fashion designer. So she's been working on her uh, new release of a design line. And, you know, looking at the financials was kind of a real challenge. And Rick, went, you know, had been going through it with her a few different times. And, you know, the glass dies look and how, do the, how does this work? We took and changed that. So Rick came in and he put some entry, you know, entries uh, items that you put in. You know, how much are you going to sell it for? How, to the stores, how much of the store is going to sell it? What's your material cost? Those started being terms she could talk about. She knew those and he set it up. So when she put those numbers in, all the rest of the numbers flowed. So he used Excel to go through and do all the calculations and show, oh, based on that cost, based on the material cost, you're making money or you're not. And financials came alive to her because it was now put in terms she knew. And it was a story or a question. It wasn't so much, uh, you know, how much a material cost? I don't know. What's your manufacturing cost? I don't know. It's okay. Let's go through and step through and take the chunks of that. I have to imagine that when you're, when you're going through uh, those kinds of things with uh, uh, the people you're working with there, that you're probably facing a lot of overwhelm when you start asking those kind of questions. Yeah. How, how do you guys deal with that and help them with that? When, is, when you typically get overwhelmed, that is kind of typical. What we also find is we have a concept called just-in-time learning. It's really when people need to know things. Yeah. And the financials, when they're ready to leave, they realize they have to know them is the time they get excited about them. Uh, there's other components. Uh, for example, one of the groups here, they're application developers, and they're outsourcing some of their program development. And they need to get a contract with the developer and kind of work with that. Suddenly, they were super, you know, interested in how contracts work and how does that go through. And we spent sessions with them as well as us on the team who've been following their progress on, you know, what makes up a good contract, what are things to work out for. All right, let me, and let me ask you this then. Okay. So, so I'm, you know, drawing my, from my own experiences, um, you know, often with people with ADHD, I find um, are, you know, tend to be trusting people. And yeah. what, what do you say to the entrepreneur who has this, this friend who they want to do something with and, uh, and they're like, well, should we do a contract? They're like, yeah, it'll be okay. Well, what do you tell to those people? <laughs> well, if I could dive in, well, we absolutely agree that you do business in a business-like way with people, mm -hmm. even if it's friends. In fact, that's the most dangerous thing you can do. So in situations like that, uh, I think if you have stuff written down. So Tom and I have known each other for years, but when we set up the company, we had some of those tough decisions about, you know, what if somebody leaves partway through? Um, how does the ownership transition? Um, what happens if somebody just needs to get out or somebody gets ill or something happens? We had all those conversations beforehand. And by doing that, you tend to put those issues behind you. Um, they don't become issues anymore. Um, if you don't do that and you don't have those discussions and then you start to hit some of those points along the way, it can become really, really stressful. Um, so always our, our advice, I think we had somebody come in to the lab the other day talking about how the, uh, the team that just raised funding uh, to build an app, how professionally they were handling all their communications with investors and also how professionally they were setting up their company and doing all the right blocking and tackling. And this is from somebody that really knows the business industry, just completely impressed by the, the approach that they were taking. So our advice to everybody is always do it professionally, always, you know, when you don't understand something with a lawyer uh, or, or a legal document, don't skimp, hire a good lawyer okay. uh, because you're going to need that 
good document later. Uh, and so what about the person that says, I know I probably should do that, but I, I can't afford it. I'll just, I'll kind of just figure it out myself. I, I'll find information out online. Um, what about for that person? It's, so it's interesting because there are different ways of looking at it as well. We have uh, one of the uh, gentlemen here. He's working on a uh, design. It's new gym equipment that he wants to work on, et cetera. He actually has a friend who uh, uses SolidWorks and uses the mechanical software to do it. And he's like, he's my friend. I'm asking him a favor. How do I go and say, can we do a contract or something like that? So we changed that saying, okay, he's helping you out. You're doing that. Send him an email that documents what's happening. Document your initial idea. doesn't have to be in great detail, but document that you had the idea. Document the fact you're reaching out that you're going to help me. If there's some type of financial component to it, just document, you know, is he getting something for it? Doing for help is future proceeds. So really kind of putting that in. If you have some way of documenting, you had the idea first. Um, this is what you agreed on. It's much stronger, whether it's a formal legal contract, which is typically better, but you still have the ability to document it. And that's an easier conversation for people to have sometimes, especially with friends or friends you're asking for help. How, how do you teach people there at Edmonton Labs how to fail? That's a great question. We just had a really good uh, session on that today. We do a lot of uh, different group sessions and discussions. And we actually had a discussion today on failure. And, you know, all the great entrepreneurs I'll talk about, I failed um, hundreds of times before I had success. We had a gentleman uh, who came in. He's a uh, inventor who has over 2,000 SKUs for products in different stores. And he, he said in his basement. In places like Walmart and yeah. uh, you know, big, big chain stores, yeah. lots of quantities. Yeah. And he said, in my basement, I have about $4 million worth of failed products. <laughs> so he went on and talked about all his successes, but he was very open that, you know, these are all the things that I failed at as well. So getting comfortable with that is a challenge for some, uh, but treating them as learning experiences is a big piece and mindset and how you frame it is a big piece as well. Uh, we've done a lot with uh, Kickstarter. If you may be familiar with that, that's mm -hmm. a crowdfunding mm -hmm. And what we've been able to show is that a lot of the products that originally failed on Kickstarter were relaunched a second time and widely successful. It's from what they learned the first time, oh, interesting. build a big audience, and then be successful. Oh, interesting. I the other it. thing we've uncovered actually with the group, there's also a fear of success. I don't know if you've run across that. But Absolutely. Part of it, a fear of success and not being able to visualize themselves being successful, but also afraid of the spotlight of success. And that can be just as big a holdback for people as it can be a fear of failure. And that's something that I wasn't fully aware of until, you know, doing what we do here at the lab. And you started to see that that was there. It was something that was just counterintuitive, at least to me. And it's something that we've learned to adapt to. Uh, and try to, you know, get them beyond those issues. And I think like one story I shared today when we were talking about literally an hour ago, uh, fear of failure and how some people see grades as a big indicator. Uh, you know, getting an F on a class is a really disruptive thing that they can't let go of. And I just told them about, hey, I took a class. I, it was partial differential equations in college. It, I can't it wasn't even spell working. partial or differential. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was not working for me. Uh, the teacher I had at college was not working for me. And I had already decided um, I was a mechanical engineering student at the time. And I had already decided, oh, here's more of the story. Oops, that I, that I switched majors. I decided I didn't like mechanical at all. And I was going to switch uh, to civil engineering uh, and move forward with what I thought I would really like to do, which it turned out I did. Um, but at that point, I got a D in the class. And I've never gotten a D in my life. Uh, and I nearly got an F. And I, it didn't phase me. It was just like, well, whatever. That's my past. That's my history. Who cares? I'm moving forward with civil engineering. And then I aced it from there on out because I was engaged in it and I loved it. Mm. And I enjoyed the class and I was using everything I learned in my night job working as a civil engineer. So it was highly interactive and highly engaging. But we try to get people to move on from their past. Uh, and those are not defining moments. Uh, you have to let go of that. A, a D in a class, 
I don't walk around 30 years later with a D on my forehead as a result of that. But some of the folks here have a tough time letting go of that. And yeah, I, mean, I like what- to share with people that it took me three, three tries to get through uh, college algebra. Uh, two tries to get through college statistics and the C that I earned at a community college was not an earned C. Uh, like I, I should not have passed that <laughs> class. Uh, and you know, it's like that does not make like that does not define me by in no. any sense of the imagination. You know, it's, it's um, you know, Rick, you had said, use the, the uh, phrase, a spotlight on success and, and, as that kind of creates fear. And I really like that analogy because, you know, one of the things that was really interesting in my journey is, you know, my, after my freshman year of college, uh, which I almost basically almost failed out of college, you know, I had a 2.2 my first semester, 1.8 in my second semester, and I actually tried studying my second semester. Um, and then I, that's when I got my diagnosis of ADHD. And what happened was, so the next semester I got the diagnosis, I started taking medication, I got a 375. And now I raised the bar. And from that point on, the that thought of, can I do that again? I don't know if I can do that again. And then I did it again. It's like, oh man, I just did it twice. Is there really any way I can do it again? And so it's what I've realized is that for each, and I was just talking to, to Alan Brown uh, um, a couple episodes ago about this whole idea of the every kind of every rung of the ladder of success that we climb the kind of the anxiety the fear becomes kind of greater and greater when you have this deep kind of history of screwing things up um and i think if we acknowledge it and and um you know just understand the story that we're telling ourselves about these fears and you know, we can write our our own you know we can write the next chapter we can write the next page you know so i have this fear about you know whatever it is just call it what it is and move forward anyways yeah it's that's so true and you know tied into that is one of the folks here who are talking about the success component and when he was in grade school he was the smartest in the class and he said that branded him And then he started struggling with school and he Uh, he goes, suddenly I had a lot more friends. I had a lot more people when I was the top one, I was isolated in my life. So that ties into his thought going forward too. If I do really well, am I going to be isolated by myself versus do I want to be, you know, with other people and, you know, struggles are okay and kind of moving forward. So balancing a lot of those preconceived notations and is kind of a big piece of that. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole notion of even just like being smart, I, I think is a very kind of, uh, you know, looking at like Carol Dweck's work of uh, in her book, um, uh, Mindset, you know, it's like, yeah. when we look at ourselves as as smart or, or not smart, like, it's just a binary, unhelpful way of just thinking about ourselves. It's like, I'm really creative and, and good at a lot of things. And there are certain things that I'm just really bad at. And neither of those things define who I am as a person. You know, it's, I, I get to define who I am as a person, you know, so I try to, I try to focus on where my strengths are. Yeah. So many skills in school, you do well throughout school and it really defines people when they're younger and it continues. It's a lasting impression you have. So being able to change that. And a lot of what we do here as well is working with folks to help change that, you know, thought of themselves, what's their uh, way of looking at how they act, how they worked, where they're successful. And if we can really focus on things they do well and build on those, opposed to keep focusing on things that they're not doing well and try and move them up, um, it's, it's challenging. It gives a better you know, impression of themselves as far as how they're working and what they have the ability to do. Tell me about the ideal person that comes to Inventive Labs and kind of who, who is your kind of target person that you're trying to help? I'd say actually it's a pretty big mix. I don't know if we have an ideal person. Uh, we have a wide range of folks. Uh, we really spend a lot of time with folks before they come here talking to them to just make sure that we're a good match. Uh, we have some folks who've done very, very well in school, valedictorian from high school. We've had folks who've struggled and barely made it through school. Um, we have folks who love one thing. They came here and just want to work on fashion design. They just want to work on application development, uh, just want to work on games. And that's what they love doing. We have other folks who have multiple interests. They come in and they every year they change what they want to work on. Their excitement level of things change. And we really want to work with both of them and uh, both type of those folks and help them be successful with it. And also to have them work together. Because when you take 
people with different uh, talents and different ways of looking at things, they can really complement each other. Some want to come up with that great new idea and others are good at the follow through to I'll take that idea and I'll drill it to making it better. Um, so if you look at so how many people are in your program right now? There's 10 folks right now. There's 10 folks right now. And um, is it, am I correct? Is it that people live there? No, no, they actually uh, live locally okay. or commuted. And, uh, the and where facility are you guys located? Is yeah. In Amesbury, Massachusetts, which is right up on the uh, New Hampshire line uh, on I 95 uh, in Massachusetts. So 30 or 40 miles north of Boston. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, so this is a, I mean, it's, a, it's an intensive program, right? Yeah, it's a 24 seven uh, intensive program. Most people do this as their full time uh, component and they come in and we're open 24 seven. We have formal sessions midday that we work with them. We work one on one with folks earlier in the morning or later afternoon, but it's a, uh, it's intensive. They're jumping in to figure out what they're going to do for their living. And, uh, you know, they want to put, spend time and make a success out of that. Yeah, along the lines of your previous question, the, the ideal candidate is somebody that has all the things that Tom was just talking about, but also they want to make a change. They're ready to move to the next step in their life. As a coach, that's my ideal client too. <laughs> that, that's yeah. what you're trying to get to. And we're there to help them make that leap. If we can get them to, to show up and <laughs> come to the lab, that's really what we focus on. So let me ask you this. What is the, obviously a program like this is intensive, um, is, is an investment and, and anything in personal growth is really going to, you, you got to invest in yourselves to get something out of it. What is the investment though to be part of this intensive program? So on the, uh, the we, we've broken the program out. It's interesting. We uh, started with a one year program and it turned out that we found that about six months through the program, Everyone, it was kind of like the trunks of a tree. Everyone started in the same trunk. And then when they figured out what they wanted to work on, it went boom and exploded in a bunch of different directions. You know, fashion, writing books, uh, you know, creating tables. I mean, we went, we, you know, we pretty much hit the entire spectrum of what people would want to work on. So we, we decided recently to split the program into two chunks. So the first chunk is the brainstorming and project uh, formulation stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second chunk is really actioning on your idea, whether that's raising investment, uh, licensing out your idea, um, you know, uh, trying to find family investment or, you know, bigger investment, angel so really or venture helping dollars. helping you go from idea and then actually helping you implement it. To create it okay. and start start to make money with your idea. So it's $11,750 per session, per mm -hmm. six-month session is the way that we're structured. And then we also have an optional meal plan for folks. Uh, we find that it's a good idea to stay here once you get here instead of wandering around the streets of Amesbury looking for lunch or dinner uh, in the evening be, to stay focused. So uh, that uh, is about, I think it's $2,900 per six months yeah. uh, if you if you want that. Yeah. The other interesting thing, Eric, is we're also trying to generate revenue while folks are here as well. So one of the goals where they do a Kickstarter project or something else is also to earn some revenue back. So although there's a fee to come in, we also want to help folks generate money when they're here as well, which is part of the launch of your career. So it's really, it sounds mean, more almost like a group apprenticeship in a lot of ways versus just like you're coming here to learn the stuff. You're, you're learning the stuff and you're, you're helping people kind of move forward towards those goals, including the scary stuff, like maybe writing a business plan, get, trying to get loans from the bank, I mean, all those things that people might think about, but never take action on. Right. And if you tell people when they come here, guess what? You're going to be running a business or, you know, licensing an idea that you have in, in you know, 12 months, that can be a little disconcerting for people. You know, that spotlight and fear of success. We really break it down into chunks. And it's funny, as they move along the process, they learn at each stage along the way the key elements that they need to actually do it. And when they're finally standing in front of investors, they've done their homework, whether it's a banker, whether it's a family member, a parent, um, angel investors, or venture capitalists. They know their stuff by the time they get to that point, and it's not as fearful a step to make that transition, and then hopefully start making money doing what they love. Uh, for for those who are able to afford it, it sounds like a, an amazing opportunity. Um, something that, that that if I didn't have a family and uh, you know timing was right for me, I, 
I'd like to uh, come out there and, and you know give that a go because it was probably, I'm sure I still have I have a lot to learn. I'm always learning. Um, so it sounds like it's a really neat uh, um, you know project that you guys are creating and growing. That's, yeah, that's what we love love about it as well because we're always learning as well. <laughs> I'm learning about boy game industry and fashion design and mechanical stuff I never knew. So it is what's fascinating here is everyone's here learning together. I think the person to be most afraid of is the person that says they know everything. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Rick and uh, Tom, tell us where uh, people can learn more about what you guys are doing. Yeah, so we uh, we are uh, obviously online. Our website is inventivelabs.org. It's uh, Inventive Labs is all one word. We also have a Twitter account, which I think you'll like, called at Inventives Rise. Uh, also, um, we have a Facebook page and, uh, recently, uh, we were able to do a TEDx talk as well. And that's going to be going live on the TEDx site in a, probably a, hopefully a couple of weeks. And that really kind of tells the story about the lab and some of the things that people have done while they're here and what's different about the approach that we take. So there's lots of, you know, venues as well. And then obviously, uh, you know, they can learn more by listening to your chat here. <laughs> Awesome. Well, all those links that you just mentioned uh, will be on the show notes page for this episode. Rick and Tom, I want to thank you guys so much for uh, for spending some time with me, and um, you know, I just really appreciate what you're doing. It's 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 cool and it's exciting, and I wish you guys all the best of success. Great. Well, thanks, Eric. We yeah, really appreciate being on the show and uh, enjoy the conversation today. Thank you, and hopefully, everyone was able to get an opportunity, a chance, to learn a nugget that will uh, help you get your ADHD rewired. Thank you for listening to another episode of ADHD Rewired. And if you're new to the show, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We are more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. You can see a full outline of this and all other episodes with all the links and other resources mentioned during this interview at ADHDrewired.com. Help support this podcast by checking out my sponsors. I use Zoom video conferencing nearly every day and so can you. Go free or go pro, but please go to erictibbers.com slash Zoom so they know that I sent you. And you can get a free audiobook from Audible at erictibbers.com slash Audible. And next time you shop Amazon, use the Amazon search portal at ADHDrewired.com. A small percentage of your purchase will go to support this show. And it doesn't cost you anything extra. You can also support this podcast by leaving an honest rating and review in iTunes or Stitcher. This really helps other people find this show. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Don't just be a passive listener, be an active member of the ADHD Rewired community. We are on Facebook. You can like our page, but please submit your request to join our free and growing community. And don't forget to check your other inbox because I screen everybody before they come into our community. Looking for a coach? If you're still listening at this point and you answered yes, come to my website at ADHDrewire.com and schedule your free 20-minute consultation or call me at 224-993-9450. Is your school, business, or organization hiring speakers? I provide fun and engaging presentations full of practical solutions that both educate and entertain. Hire me for your next professional development day or corporate training event. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash talks. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.